the Great Jewish Revolt, Siege and Destruction of Jerusalem, A.D. 70, by Josephus, Part 4. In the meantime, Josephus, as he was going round the city, had his head wounded by a stone that was thrown at him, upon which he fell down as giddy. Josephus soon recovered of his wound, and came out and cried out aloud that it would not be long ere they should be punished for this wound they had given him. He also made a fresh exhortation to the people to come out upon the security that would be given them. This sight of Josephus encouraged the people greatly, and brought a great consternation upon the seditious. Hereupon, some of the deserters, having no other way, leaped down from the wall immediately, while others of them went out of the city with stones, as if they would fight them. But thereupon they fled away to the Romans. But here a worse fate accompanied these than what they had found within the city, and they met with a quicker despatch from the too great abundance they had among the Romans than they could have done from the famine among the Jews. For when they came first to the Romans, they were puffed up by the famine and swelled, like men in a dropsy. After which they all on the sudden overfilled those bodies that were before empty, and so burst asunder, excepting such only as were skillful enough to restrain their appetites, and by degrees took in their food into bodies unaccustomed thereto. Yet did another plague seize upon those that were thus preserved, for there was found among the Syrian deserters a certain person who was caught gathering pieces of gold out of the excrements of the Jews' bellies, for the deserters used to swallow such pieces of gold as we told you before when they came out, and for these did the seditious search them all, for there was a great quantity of gold in the city, insomuch that as much was now sold in the Roman camp for twelve Attic drachmas, as was sold before for twenty-five. But when this contrivance was discovered in one instance, the fame of it filled their several camps, that the deserters came to them full of gold. So the multitude of the Arabians, with the Syrians, cut up those that came as supplicants, and searched their bellies. Nor does it seem to me that any misery befell the Jews that was more terrible than this, since in one night's time about two thousand of these deserters were thus dissected. When Titus came to the knowledge of this wicked practice, he threatened that he would put such men to death if any of them were discovered to be so insolent as to do so again. Moreover, he gave it in charge to the legions that they should make a search after such as were suspected, and should bring them to him. But it appeared that the love of money was too great for all their dread of punishment, and a vehement desire of gain is natural to men, and no passion is so venturesome as covetousness. Otherwise, such passions have certain bounds, and are subordinate to fear. But in reality it was God who condemned the whole nation, and turned every course that was taken for their preservation to their destruction. This, therefore, which was forbidden by Caesar under such a threatening, was ventured upon privately against the deserters, and these barbarians would go out still, and meet those that ran away before any saw them, and, looking about them to see that no Romans spied them, they dissected them and pulled this polluted money out of their bowels, which money was still found in a few of them, while yet a great many were destroyed by the bare hope there was of thus getting by them, which miserable treatment made many that were deserting to return back again into the city. And indeed, why do I relate these particular calamities? While Menaeus, the son of Lazarus, came running to Titus at this very time, and told him that there had been carried out through that one gate, which was entrusted to his care, no fewer than a hundred and fifteen thousand eight hundred and eighty dead bodies in the interval between the fourteenth day of the month Xanthicus, Nisan, when the Romans pitched their camp by the city, and the first day of the month, Panemus, Tammuz. This was itself a prodigious multitude, and though this man was not himself set as a governor at that gate, 
yet was he appointed to pay the public stipend for carrying these bodies out, and so was obliged of necessity to number them, while the rest were buried by their relations, though all their burial was but this, to bring them away and cast them out of the city. After this man there ran away to Titus many of the eminent citizens, and told him the entire number of the poor that were dead, and that no fewer than six hundred thousand were thrown out at the gates, though still the number of the rest could not be discovered. And they told him further that, when they were no longer able to carry out the dead bodies of the poor, they laid their corpses on heaps in very large houses and shut them up therein, as also that a medimno of wheat was sold for a talent, and that when, a while afterward, it was not possible to gather herbs, by reason the city was all walled about, some persons were driven to that terrible distress as to search the common sewers and old dunghills of cattle, and to eat the dung which they got there and what they of old could not endure so much as to see, they now used for food. When the Romans barely heard all this, they commiserated their case, while the seditious, who saw it also, did not repent, but suffered the same distress to come upon themselves, for they were blinded by that fate which was already coming upon the city, and upon themselves also. And now the Romans, although they were greatly distressed in getting together their materials, raised their banks in one and twenty days. After they had cut down all the trees that were in the country that adjoined to the city, and that for ninety furlongs round about. And when the banks were finished, they afforded a foundation for fear both to the Romans and to the Jews. For the Jews expected that the city would be taken unless they could burn those banks, as did the Romans expect that, if these were once burned down, they should never be able to take it, for there was a mighty scarcity of materials, and the bodies of the soldiers began to fail with such hard labors, as did their souls faint with so many instances of ill success. The Romans had an advantage, in that their engines for sieges cooperated with them in throwing darts and stones as far as the Jews, when they were coming out of the city, whereby the man that fell became an impediment to him that was next to him, as did the danger of going farther make them less zealous in their attempts. And for those that had run under the darts, some of them were terrified by the good order and closeness of the enemy's ranks before they came to a close fight, and others were pricked with their spears and turned back again. At length they reproached one another for their cowardice, and retired without doing anything. This attack was made upon the first day of the month Panemus, Tammuz. So when the Jews were retreated, the Romans brought their engines, although they had all the while stones thrown at them from the tower of Antonia, and were assaulted by fire and sword, and by all sorts of darts, which necessity afforded the Jews to make use of, for although these had great dependence on their own wall, and a contempt of the Roman engines, yet did they endeavor to hinder the Romans from bringing them. Now these Romans struggled hard, on the contrary, to bring them, as deeming that this zeal of the Jews was in order to avoid any impression to be made on the tower of Antonia, because its wall was but weak and its foundations rotten. However, that tower did not yield to the blows given it from the engines. Yet did the Romans bear the impressions made by the enemy's darts, which were perpetually cast at them, and did not give way to any of those dangers that came upon them from above. And so they brought their engines to bear. But then, as they were beneath the other, and were sadly wounded by the stones thrown down upon them, some of them threw their shields over their bodies, and partly with their hands, and partly with their bodies, and partly with crows, they undermined its foundations, and with great pains they removed four of its stones. Then night came upon both sides, and put an end to this struggle for the present. However, that night the wall was so shaken by the battering rams in that place where John had used his stratagem before, and had undermined their banks, that the ground then gave way, and the wall fell down suddenly. 
When this accident had unexpectedly happened, the minds of both parties were variously affected, for though one would expect that the Jews would be discouraged, because this fall of their wall was unexpected by them, and they had made no provision in that case, yet did they pull up their courage, because the tower of Antonia itself was still standing, as was the unexpected joy of the Romans at this fall of the wall soon quenched by the sight they had of another wall, which John and his party had built within it. Upon the fifth day of the month Panemus, Tammuz, twelve of those men that were on the forefront and kept watch upon the banks got together and called to them the standard-bearer of the fifth legion, and two others of a troop of horsemen, and one trumpeter. These went without noise, about the ninth hour of the night, through the ruins to the tower of Antonia. And when they had cut the throats of the first guards of the place, as they were asleep, they got possession of the wall and ordered the trumpeter to sound his trumpet. Upon which the rest of the guard got up on the sudden and ran away before anybody could see how many they were that were gotten up, for partly from the fear they were in, and partly from the sound of the trumpet which they heard they imagined a great number of the enemy were gotten up. But as soon as Caesar heard the signal, he ordered the army to put on their armor immediately, and came thither with his commanders, and first of all ascended, as did the chosen men that were with him. And as the Jews were flying away to the temple, they fell into that mine which John had dug under the Roman banks. Then did the seditious of both the bodies of the Jewish army, as well that belonging to John as that belonging to Simon, drive them away, and indeed were no way wanting as to the highest degree of force and alacrity, for they esteemed themselves entirely ruined if once the Romans got into the temple, as did the Romans look upon the same thing as the beginning of their entire conquest. So a terrible battle was fought at the entrance of the temple. While the Romans were forcing their way in order to get possession of that temple, and the Jews were driving them back to the Tower of Antonia, in which battle the darts were on both sides useless, as well as the spears, and both sides drew their swords and fought it out hand to hand. Now, during this struggle, the positions of the men were undistinguished on both sides, and they fought at random, the men being intermixed one with another, and confounded by reason of the narrowness of the place, while the noise that was made fell on the ear after an indistinct manner, because it was so very loud. Great slaughter was now made on both sides, and the combatants trod upon the bodies and the armor of those that were dead, and dashed them to pieces. Accordingly, to which side soever the battle inclined, those that had the advantage exhorted one another to go on, as did those that were beaten make great lamentation. But still there was no room for flight nor for pursuit, but disorderly revolutions and retreats, while the armies were intermixed one with another. But those that were in the first ranks were under the necessity of killing or being killed, without any way for escaping. For those on both sides that came behind forced those before them to go on, without leaving any space between the armies. At length, the Jews' violent zeal was too hard for the Romans' skill, and the battle already inclined entirely that way, for the fight had lasted from the ninth hour of the night till the seventh hour of the day, while the Jews came on in crowds and had the danger the temple was in for their motive. The Romans, having no more here than a part of their army, for those legions, on which the soldiers on that side depended, were not come up to them. So it was at present thought sufficient by the Romans to take possession of the Tower of Antonia. In the meantime, the rest of the Roman army had, in seven days' time, overthrown some foundations of the Tower of Antonia, and had made a ready and broad way to the temple. Then did the legions come near the first court, and began to raise their banks. The one bank was over against the northwest corner of the inner temple, 
another was at that northern edifice which was between the two gates and of the other two one was at the western cloister of the outer court of the temple the other against its northern cloister however these works were thus far advanced by the romans not without great pains and difficulty and particularly by being obliged to bring their materials from the distance of a hundred furlongs they had further difficulties also upon them sometimes by their over great security they were in that they should overcome the jewish snares laid for them and by that boldness of the jews which their despair of escaping had inspired them with all in the meantime the jews were so distressed by the fights they had been in as the war advanced higher and higher and creeping up to the holy house itself that they as it were cut off those limbs of their body which were infected in order to prevent the distempers spreading further for they set the northwest cloister which was joined to the tower of antonia on fire and after that break off about twenty cubits of that cloister and thereby made a beginning in burning the sanctuary two days after which or on the twenty-fourth day of the forenamed month panamas or tammuz the romans set fire to the cloister that joined to the other when the fire went fifteen cubits farther the jews in like manner cut off its roof nor did they entirely leave off what they were about till the tower of antonia was parted from the temple even when it was in their power to have stopped the fire nay they lay still while the temple was first set on fire and deemed this spreading of the fire to be for their own advantage however the armies were still fighting one against another about the temple and the war was managed by continual sallies of particular parties against one another now of those that perished by famine in the city the number was prodigious and the miseries they underwent were unspeakable. For if so much as the shadow of any kind of food did anywhere appear, a war was commenced presently, and the dearest friends fell a-fighting one with another about it, snatching from each other the most miserable supports of life. Nor would men believe that those who were dying had no food, but the robbers would search them when they were expiring, lest any one should have concealed food in his bosom and counterfeited dying nay these robbers gaped for want and ran about stumbling and staggering along like mad dogs and reeling against the doors of the houses like drunken men they would also in the great distress they were in rush into the very same houses two or three times in one and the same day moreover their hunger was so intolerable that it obliged them to chew everything, while they gathered such things as the most sordid animals would not touch, and endured to eat them. Nor did they at length abstain from girdles and shoes, and the very leather which belonged to their shields they pulled off and gnawed. The very wisps of old hay became food to some, and some gathered up fibers and sold a very small weight of them, for four attic drachmas but why do i describe the shameless impudence that the famine brought on men in their eating inanimate things while i am going to relate a matter of fact the like to which no history relates either among the greeks or barbarians it is horrible to speak of it and incredible when heard i had indeed willingly omitted this calamity of ours that I might not seem to deliver what is so portentous to posterity, but that I have innumerable witnesses to it in my own age. And besides, my country would have had little reason to thank me for suppressing the miseries that she underwent at this time. There was a certain woman that dwelt beyond Jordan. Her name was Mary. Her father was Eleazar of the village Bethesab, which signifies the house of Hysop she was eminent for her family and her wealth and had fled away to jerusalem with the rest of the multitude and was with them besieged therein at this time the other effects of this woman had been already seized upon such i mean as she had brought with her out of perea and removed to the city what she had treasured up besides as also what food she had contrived 
to save, had been also carried off by the rapacious guards, who came every day running into her house for that purpose. This put the poor woman into a very great passion, and by the frequent reproaches and imprecations she cast at these rapacious villains, she had provoked them to anger against her. But none of them, either out of the indignation she had raised against herself, or out of commiseration of her case, would take away her life, and if she found any food, she perceived her labors were for others and not for herself, and it was now become impossible for her, anyway, to find any more food, while the famine pierced through her very bowels and marrow, when also her passion was fired to a degree beyond the famine itself, nor did she consult with anything but with her passion and the necessity she was in. She then attempted a most unnatural thing, and snatching up her son, who was a child, sucking at her breast, she said, O oh, thou miserable infant, for whom shall I preserve thee in this war, this famine, and this sedition? As to the war with the Romans, if they preserve our lives, we must be slaves. This famine also will destroy us even before that slavery comes upon us. Yet are these seditious rogues more terrible than both the other. Come on, be thou my food, and be thou a fury to these seditious varlets, and a byword to the world, which is all that is now wanting to complete the calamities of us Jews. As soon as she had said this, she slew her son, and then roasted him, and eat the one half of him, and kept the other half by her concealed. Upon this the seditious came in presently, and smelling the horrid scent of this food, they threatened her that they would cut her throat immediately if she did not show them what food she had gotten ready. She replied that she had saved a very fine portion of it for them, and withal uncovered what was left of her son. Hereupon they were seized with a horror and amazement of mind, and stood astonished at the sight when she said to them, This is mine own son, and what hath been done was mine own doing. Come, eat of this food, for I have eaten of it myself. Do not you pretend to be either more tender than a woman or more compassionate than a mother? But if you be so scrupulous and do abominate this my sacrifice, as I have eaten the one half, let the rest be reserved for me also. After which, those men went out trembling, being never so much affrighted at anything as they were at this, and with some difficulty they left the rest of that meat to the mother. Upon which, the whole city was full of this horrid action immediately, and while everybody laid this miserable case before their own eyes, they trembled, as if this unheard of action had been done by themselves. So those that were thus distressed by the famine were very desirous to die, and those already dead were esteemed happy, because they had not lived long enough either to hear or to see such miseries. This sad instance was quickly told to the Romans, some of whom could not believe it, and others pitied the distress which the Jews were under, but there were many of them who were hereby induced to a more bitter hatred than ordinary against our nation. But for Caesar, he excused himself before God as to this matter, and said that he had proposed peace and liberty to the Jews, as well as an oblivion of all their former insolent practices, but that they, instead of concord, had chosen sedition, instead of peace, war, and before satiety and abundance, a famine, that they had begun with their own hands to burn down that temple which we have preserved hitherto, and that therefore they deserved to eat such food as this was. That, however, this horrid action of eating an own child ought to be covered with the overthrow of their very country itself, and men ought not to leave such a city upon the habitable earth to be seen by the sun wherein mothers are thus fed, although such food be fitter for the fathers than for the mothers to eat of, since it is they that continue still in a state of war against us after they have undergone such miseries as these. And at the same time that he said this, 
he reflected on the desperate condition these men must be in nor could he expect that such men could be recovered to sobriety of mind after they had endured those very sufferings for the avoiding whereof it only was probable they might have repented the great jewish revolt siege and destruction of jerusalem a d seventy by josephus part five and now two of the legions had completed their banks on the eighth day of the month Lus, ab whereupon titus gave orders that the battering rams should be brought and set over against the western edifice of the inner temple for before these were brought the firmest of all the other engines had battered the wall for six days together without ceasing without making any impression upon it but the vast largeness and strong connection of the stones were superior to that engine and to the other battering rams also other romans did indeed undermine the foundations of the northern gate and after a world of pains removed the outermost stones yet was the gate still upheld by the inner stones and stood still unhurt till the workmen despairing of all such attempts by engines and crows brought their ladders to the cloisters now the jews did not interrupt them in so doing but when they were gotten up they fell upon them and fought with them some of them they thrust down and threw them backward headlong others of them they met and slew they also beat many of those that went down the ladders again and slew them with their swords before they could bring their shields to protect them nay some of the ladders they threw down from above when they were full of armed men a great slaughter was made of the jews also at the same time while those that bear the ensigns fought hard for them as deeming it a terrible thing and what would tend to their great shame if they permitted them to be stolen away yet did the jews at length get possession of these engines and destroyed those that had gone up the ladders while the rest were so intimidated by what those suffered who were slain that they retired although none of the romans died without having done good service before his death of the seditious those that had fought bravely in the former battles did the like now as besides them did eleazar the brother's son of simon the tyrant but when titus perceived that his endeavors to spare a foreign temple turned to the damage of his soldiers and made them be killed he gave orders to set the gates on fire but then on the next day titus commanded part of his army to quench the fire and to make a road for the more easy marching up of the legions while he himself gathered the commanders together titus proposed to these that they should give him their advice what should be done about the holy house now some of these thought it would be the best way to act according to the rules of war and demolish it because the jews would never leave off rebelling while that house was standing at which house it was that they used to get all together others of them were of opinion that in case the jews would leave it and none of them would lay their arms up in it he might save it but that in case they got upon it and fought any more he might burn it because it must then be looked upon not as a holy house but as a citadel and that the impiety of burning it would then belong to those that forced this to be done and not to them but titus said that quote, although the jews should get upon that holy house and fight us thence yet ought we not to revenge ourselves on things that are inanimate instead of the men themselves End quote. and that he was not in any case for burning down so vast a work as that was because this would be a mischief to the romans themselves as it would be an ornament to their government while it continued so fronto and alexander and serialis grew bold upon that declaration and agreed to the opinion of titus then was this assembly dissolved when titus had given orders to the commanders that the rest of their forces should lie still but that they should make use of such as were most courageous in this attack so he commanded that the chosen men that were taken out of the cohorts should make their way through the ruins and quench the fire now it is true that on this day the jews were so weary and under such consternation 
that they refrained from any attacks. But on the next day they gathered their whole force together, and ran upon those that guarded the outward court of the temple very boldly, through the east gate, and this about the second hour of the day. These guards received their attack with great bravery, and by covering themselves with their shields before, as if it were with a wall, drew their squadron close together. Yet was it evident that they could not abide there very long, but would be overborne by the multitude of those that sallied out upon them, and by the heat of their passion. However, Caesar, seeing from the tower of Antonia that this squadron was likely to give way, sent some chosen horsemen to support them. Hereupon the Jews found themselves not able to sustain their onset, and upon the slaughter of those in the forefront, many of the rest were put to flight. But as the Romans were going off, the Jews turned upon them and fought them, and as those Romans came back upon them, they retreated again, until about the fifth hour of the day they were overborne, and shut themselves up in the inner court of the temple. So Titus retired into the tower of Antonia, and resolved to storm the temple the next day, early in the morning, with his whole army, and to encamp round about the holy house. But as for that house, God had for certain long ago doomed it to the fire, and now that fatal day was come according to the revolution of ages. It was the tenth day of the month Luce, Ab, upon which it was formerly burned by the king of Babylon, although these flames took their rise from the Jews themselves, and were occasioned by them. For upon Titus's retiring, the seditious lay still for a little while, and then attacked the Romans again, when those that guarded the holy house fought with those that quenched the fire that was burning the inner court of the temple. But these Romans put the Jews to flight, and proceeded as far as the holy house itself, at which time one of the soldiers, without staying for any orders, and without any concern or dread upon him at so great an undertaking, and being hurried on by a certain divine fury, snatched somewhat out of the materials that were on fire, and, being lifted up by another soldier, he set fire to a golden window, through which there was a passage to the rooms that were round about the holy house on the north side of it. As the flames went upward, the Jews made a great clamor, such as so mighty an affliction required, and ran together to prevent it. And now they spared not their lives any longer, nor suffered anything to restrain their force, since that holy house was perishing, for whose sake it was that they kept such a guard about it. And now Caesar was no way able to restrain the enthusiastic fury of the soldiers, and the fire proceeded on more and more. He went into the holy place of the temple with his commanders, and saw it, with what was in it, which he found to be far superior to what the relations of foreigners contained, and not inferior to what we ourselves boasted of and believed about it. But as the flame had not as yet reached to its inward parts, but was still consuming the rooms that were about the holy house, and Titus, supposing what the fact was that the house itself might yet be saved, came in haste and endeavored to persuade the soldiers to quench the fire, and gave order to Liberalius the centurion, and one of those spearmen that were about him, to beat the soldiers that were refractory with their staves, and to restrain them. Yet were their passions too hard for the regards they had for Caesar, and the dread they had of him who forbade them, as was their hatred of the Jews, and a certain vehement inclination to fight them, too hard for them also. Moreover, the hope of plunder induced many to go on, as, having this opinion, that all the places within were full of money, and as seeing that all round about it was made of gold. And besides, one of those that went into the place prevented Caesar, when he ran so hastily out to restrain the soldiers, and threw the fire upon the hinges of the gate in the dark, whereby the flame burst out from within the holy house itself immediately. When the commanders retired, and Caesar with them, 
and when nobody any longer forbade those that were without to set fire to it. And thus was the holy house burned down without Caesar's approbation. While the holy house was on fire, everything was plundered that came to hand, and ten thousand of those that were caught were slain, nor was there a commiseration of any age or any reverence of gravity, but children and old men and profane persons and priests were all slain in the same manner. So that this war went round all sorts of men, and brought them to destruction, and as well those that made supplication for their lives as those that defended themselves by fighting. The flame was also carried a long way, and made an echo, together with the groans of those that were slain. And because this hill was high, and the works at the temple were very great, one would have thought the whole city had been on fire. Nor can one imagine anything either greater or more terrible than this noise. For there was at once a shout of the Roman legions, who were marching all together, and a sad clamor of the seditious, who were now surrounded with fire and sword. The people also that were left above were beaten back upon the enemy, and under a great consternation, and made sad moans at the calamity they were under. The multitude also that was in the city joined in this outcry with those that were upon the hill. And besides, many of those that were worn away by the famine, and their mouths almost closed, when they saw the fire of the holy house, they exerted their utmost strength and break out into groans and outcries again. Perea did also return the echo, as well as the mountains round about the city, and augmented the force of the entire noise. Yet was the misery itself more terrible than this disorder, for one would have thought that the hill itself on which the temple stood was seething hot, as full of fire on every part of it, that the blood was larger in quantity than the fire, and those that were slain more in number than those that slew them for the ground did nowhere appear visible for the dead bodies that lay on it. But the soldiers went over heaps of those bodies, as they ran upon such as fled from them. And now it was that the multitude of the robbers were thrust out of the inner court of the temple by the Romans, and had much ado to get into the outward court, and from thence into the city, while the remainder of the populace fled into the cloister of that outer court. As for the priests, some of them plucked up from the holy house the spikes that were upon it, with their bases, which were made of lead, and shot them at the Romans instead of darts. But then, as they gained nothing by so doing, and as the fire burst out upon them, they retired to the wall that was eight cubits broad, and there they tarried. And now the Romans judging that it was in vain to spare what was round about the holy house, burned all those places, as also the remains of the cloisters and the gates, too, excepted. The one on the east side and the other on the south, both which, however, they burned afterward. They also burned down the treasury chambers, in which was an immense quantity of money, and an immense number of garments and other precious goods there reposited. And, to speak all in a few words, there it was that the entire riches of the Jews were heaped up together, while the rich people had there built themselves chambers to contain such furniture. The soldiers also came to the rest of the cloisters that were in the outer court of the temple, whither the women and children, and a great mixed multitude of the people, fled, in number about six thousand. But before Caesar had determined anything about these people, or given the commanders any orders relating to them, the soldiers were in such a rage that they set that cloister on fire, by which means it came to pass that some of these were destroyed by throwing themselves down headlong, and some were burned in the cloisters themselves, nor did any one of them escape with his life. And now... 
the Romans, upon the flight of the seditious into the city, and upon the burning of the holy house itself, and of all the buildings round about it, brought their ensigns to the temple, and set them over against its eastern gate. And there did they offer sacrifices to them, and there did they make Titus imperator, with the greatest acclamations of joy. And now all the soldiers had such vast quantities of the spoils which they had gotten by plunder, that in Syria a pound weight of gold was sold for half its former value. But as for the tyrants themselves and those that were with them, when they found that they were encompassed on every side, and as it were walled round, without any method of escaping, they desired to treat with Titus by word of mouth. Accordingly, such was the kindness of his nature, and his desire of preserving the city from destruction, joined to the advice of his friends, who now thought the robbers were come to a temper, that he placed himself on the western side of the outer court of the temple, for there were gates on that side above the Zistus, and a bridge that connected the upper city to the temple. This bridge it was that lay between the tyrants and Caesar, and parted them, while the multitude stood on each side, those of the Jewish nation about Simon and John, with great hopes of pardon, and the Romans about Caesar, in great expectation how Titus would receive their supplication. So Titus charged his soldiers to restrain their rage, and to let their darts alone, and appointed an interpreter between them, which was a sign that he was the conqueror, and first began the discourse and said, quote, I hope you, sirs, are now satiated with the miseries of your country, who have not had any just notions either of our great power or of your own great weakness, but have, like madmen, after a violent and inconsiderate manner, made such attempts as have brought your people, your city, and your holy house to destruction. You have been the men that have never left off rebelling since Pompey first conquered you, and have since that time made open war with the Romans. And now, vile wretches, do you desire to treat with me by word of mouth? To what purpose is it that you would save such a holy house as this was, which is now destroyed? What preservation can you now desire after the destruction of your temple? Yet do you stand still at this very time in your armor, nor can you bring yourselves so much as to pretend to be supplicants even in this your utmost extremity. O oh, miserable creatures! What is it you depend on? Are not your people dead? Is not your holy house gone? Is not your city in my power? And are not your own very lives in my hands? And do you still deem it a part of valor to die? However, I will not imitate your madness. If you throw down your arms and deliver up your bodies to me, I grant you your lives, and I will act like a mild master of a family. What cannot be healed shall be punished, and the rest I will preserve for my own use." End quote. To that offer of Titus they made this reply, that they could not accept of it, because they had sworn never to do so. But they desired they might have leave to go through the wall that had been made about them with their wives and children, for that they would go into the desert and leave the city to him. At this Titus had great indignation, that when they were in the case of men already taken captives, they should pretend to make their own terms with him as if they had been conquerors. So he ordered this proclamation to be made to them, that they should no more come out to him as deserters, nor hope for any further security, for that he would henceforth spare nobody, but fight them with his whole army, and that they must save themselves as well as they could, for that he would from henceforth treat them according to the laws of war, so he gave orders to the soldiers both to burn and to plunder the city, who did nothing indeed that day. But on the next day 
they set fire to the repository of the archives, to Accra, to the council house, and to the place called Oflas, at which time the fire proceeded as far as the palace of Queen Helena, which was in the middle of Accra. The lanes also were burned down, as were also those houses that were full of the dead bodies of such as were destroyed by famine. The Great Jewish Revolt, Siege, and Destruction of Jerusalem, A.D. 70, by Josephus, Part 6. On the same day it was that the sons and brethren of Izates the king, together with many others of the eminent men of the populace, got together there, and besought Caesar to give them his right hand for their security. Upon which, though he was very angry at all that were now remaining, yet did he not lay aside his old moderation, but received these men. At that time, indeed, he kept them all in custody, but still bound the king's sons and kinsmen, and led them with him to Rome, in order to make them hostages for their country's fidelity to the Romans. And now the seditious rushed into the royal palace, into which many had put their effects, because it was so strong, and drove the Romans away from it. They also slew all the people that had crowded into it, who were in number about 8,400, and plundered them of what they had. On the next day the Romans drove the robbers out of the lower city, and set all on fire as far as Siloam. These soldiers were indeed glad to see the city destroyed, but they missed the plunder, because the seditious had carried off all their effects, and were retired into the upper city, for they did not yet at all repent of the mischiefs they had done but were insolent, as if they had done well. For, as they saw the city on fire, they appeared cheerful, and put on joyful countenances, in expectation, as they said, of death to end their miseries. Accordingly, as the people were now slain, the holy house was burned down, and the city was on fire. There was nothing further left for the enemy to do. Yet did not Josephus grow weary, even in this utmost extremity, to beg of them to spare what was left of the city. He spake largely to them about their barbarity and impiety, and gave them his advice in order to their escape, though he gained nothing thereby more than to be laughed at by them. And as they could not think of surrendering themselves up, because of the oath they had taken, nor were strong enough to fight with the Romans any longer upon the square, as being surrounded on all sides, and a kind of prisoners already, yet were they so accustomed to kill people, that they could not restrain their right hands from acting accordingly. So they dispersed themselves before the city, and laid themselves in ambush among its ruins, to catch those that attempted to desert to the Romans. Accordingly, many such deserters were caught by them, and were all slain, for these were too weak, by reason of their want of food, to fly away from them, so their dead bodies were thrown to the dogs. Now every other sort of death was thought more tolerable than the famine, insomuch that, though the Jews despaired now of mercy, yet would they fly to the Romans, and would themselves, even of their own accord, fall among the murderous rebels also. Nor was there any place in the city that had no dead bodies in it, but what was entirely covered with those that were killed either by the famine or the rebellion, and all was full of the dead bodies of such as had perished, either by that sedition or by the famine. So now the last hope which supported the tyrants and that crew of robbers who were with them was in the caves and caverns underground, whither if they could once fly, they did not expect to be searched for, but endeavored that after the whole city should be destroyed and the Romans gone away, they might come out again and escape from them. This was no better than a dream of theirs, for they were not able to lie hid, either from God or from the Romans. However, they depended on these underground subterfuges, and set more places on fire than did the Romans themselves, and those that fled out of their houses thus set on fire into the ditches, 
they killed without mercy, and pillaged them also, and if they discovered food belonging to any one, they seized upon it and swallowed it down, together with their blood also. Nay, they were now come to fight one with another about their plunder, and I cannot but think that, had not their destruction prevented it, their barbarity would have made them taste of even the dead bodies themselves. Now, when Caesar perceived that the upper city was so steep that it could not possibly be taken without raising banks against it, he distributed the several parts of that work among his army, and this on the twentieth day of the month Luz, Ab. It was at this time that the commanders of the Idumeans got together privately and took counsel about surrendering up themselves to the Romans. Accordingly, they sent five men to Titus and entreated him to give them his right hand for their security. So Titus, thinking that the tyrants would yield if the Idumeans, upon whom a great part of the war depended, were once withdrawn from them, after some reluctancy and delay, complied with them and gave them security for their lives and sent the five men back. But as these Idumeans were preparing to march out, Simon perceived it and immediately slew the five men that had gone to Titus and took their commanders and put them in prison, of whom the most eminent was Jacob, the son of Sosas. But as for the multitude of the Idumeans, who did not at all know what to do, now their commanders were taken from them, he had them watched and secured the walls by a more numerous garrison. Yet could not that garrison resist those that were deserting, for although a great number of them were slain, yet were the deserters many more in number. These were all received by the Romans, because Titus himself grew negligent as to his former orders for killing them, and because the very soldiers grew weary of killing them, and because they hoped to get some money by sparing them, for they left only the populace and sold the rest of the multitude with their wives and children, and every one of them at a very low price, and that because such as were sold were very many, and the buyers were few. And although Titus had made proclamation beforehand that no deserter should come alone by himself, that so they might bring out their families with them, yet did he receive such as these also. However, he set over them such as were to distinguish some from others, in order to see if any of them deserved to be punished. And indeed, the number of those that were sold was immense. But of the populace, above forty thousand were saved, whom Caesar let go, whither every one of them pleased. But now at this time it was, that one of the priests, the son of Thebuthus, whose name was Jesus, upon his having security given him, by the oath of Caesar, that he should be preserved upon condition that he should deliver to him certain of the precious things that had been deposited in the temple, came out of it, and delivered him from the wall of the holy house two candlesticks, like to those that lay in the holy house, with tables and cisterns and vials, all made of solid gold and very heavy. He also delivered to him the veils and the garments, with the precious stones, and a great number of other precious vessels that belonged to their sacred worship. The treasurer of the temple also, whose name was Phineas, was seized on, and showed Titus the coats and girdles of the priests, with a great quantity of purple and scarlet, which were there deposited for the uses of the veil, as also a great deal of cinnamon and cassia, with a large quantity of other sweet spices, which used to be mixed together and offered as incense to God every day. A great many other treasures were also delivered to him, with sacred ornaments of the temple not a few, which things thus delivered to Titus, obtained of him for this man the same pardon that he had allowed to such as deserted of their own accord. And now were the banks finished on the seventh day of the month Gorpius, Elul, in eighteen days' time, when the Romans brought their machines against the wall, but for the seditious, 
Some of them, as despairing of saving the city, retired from the wall to the citadel. Others of them went down into the subterranean vaults, though still a great many of them defended themselves against those that brought the engines for the battery. Yet did the Romans overcome them by their number and by their strength. And what was the principal thing of all, by going cheerfully about their work, while the Jews were quite dejected and become weak? Now, as soon as a part of the wall was battered down, and certain of the towers yielded to the impression of the battering rams, those that opposed themselves fled away, and such a terror fell upon the tyrants as was much greater than the occasion required. For before the enemy got over the breach, they were quite stunned, and were immediately for flying away. And now one might see these men who had hitherto been so insolent and arrogant in their wicked practices, to be cast down and to tremble, insomuch that it would pity one's heart to observe the change that was made in those vile persons. Accordingly, they ran with great violence upon the Roman wall that encompassed them, in order to force away those that guarded it, and to break through it and get away. But when they saw that those who had formerly been faithful to them had gone away, as indeed they were fled whithersoever the great distress they were in persuaded them to flee, as also when those that came running before the rest told them that the western wall was entirely overthrown, while others said the Romans were gotten in, and others that they were near and looking out for them, which were only the dictates of their fear, which imposed upon their sight, they fell upon their face and greatly lamented their own mad conduct, and their nerves were so terribly loosed that they could not flee away. And here one may chiefly reflect on the power of God exercised upon these wicked wretches, and on the good fortune of the Romans, for these tyrants did now wholly deprive themselves of the security they had in their own power and came down from those very towers of their own accord, wherein they could have never been taken by force, nor indeed by any other way than by famine. And thus did the Romans, when they had taken such great pains about weaker walls, get by good fortune what they could never have gotten by their engines, for three of these towers were too strong for all mechanical engines whatsoever. So they now left these towers of themselves, or rather, they were ejected out of them by God himself, and fled immediately to that valley which was under Siloam, where they again recovered themselves out of the dread they were in for a while, and ran violently against that part of the Roman wall which lay on that side. But as their courage was too much depressed to make their attacks with sufficient force, and their power was now broken with fear and affliction, they were repulsed by the guards, and, dispersing themselves at distances from each other, went down into the subterranean caverns. So the Romans, being now become masters of the walls, they both placed their ensigns upon the towers, and made joyful acclamations for the victory they had gained, as having found the end of this war much lighter than its beginning. For when they had gotten upon the last wall, without any bloodshed, they could hardly believe what they found to be true. But seeing nobody to oppose them, they stood in doubt what such an unusual solitude could mean. But when they went in numbers into the lanes of the city, with their swords drawn, they slew those whom they overtook without mercy, and set fire to the houses whither the Jews were fled, and burned every soul in them, and laid waste a great many of the rest. And when they were come to the houses to plunder them, they found in them entire families of dead men, and the upper rooms full of corpses, that is, of such as died by the famine, they stood in horror at this sight, and went out without touching anything. Although they had this commiseration for such as were destroyed in that manner, yet had they not the same for those that were still alive, but they ran every one through whom they met, and obstructed the very lanes with their dead bodies, 
and made the whole city run with blood, to such a degree, indeed, that the fire of many of the houses was quenched with these men's blood. And truly so it happened, that though the slayers left off at the evening, yet did the fire greatly prevail in the night, and as all was burning, came that eighth day of the month Gorpeus, Elul, upon Jerusalem, a city that had been liable to so many miseries during this siege, that, had it always enjoyed as much happiness from its first foundation, it would certainly have been the envy of the world. Nor did it, on any other account, so much deserve these sore misfortunes, as by producing such a generation of men as were the occasion of this its overthrow. Now, when Titus was come into this upper city, he admired not only some other places of strength in it, but particularly those strong towers which the tyrants in their mad conduct had relinquished. For when he saw their solid altitude and the largeness of their several stones, and the exactness of their joints, as also how great was their breadth and how extensive their length, he expressed himself after the manner following, quote, We have certainly had God for our assistant in this war, and it was no other than God who ejected the Jews out of these fortifications. For what could the hands of men or any machines do toward overthrowing these towers? End quote. At which time he had many such discourses to his friends. He also let such go free as had been bound by the tyrants, and were left in the prisons. To conclude, when he entirely demolished the rest of the city and overthrew its walls, he left these towers as a monument of his good fortune, which had proved his auxiliaries and enabled him to take what could not otherwise have been taken by him. And now, since his soldiers were already quite tired with killing men, and yet there appeared to be a vast multitude still remaining alive, Caesar gave orders that they should kill none but those that were in arms and opposed them, but should take the rest alive. But together with those whom they had orders to slay, they slew the aged and the infirm. But for those that were in their flourishing age, and who might be useful to them, they drove them together into the temple, and shut them up within the walls of the court of the women, over which Caesar set one of his freedmen, as also Fronto, one of his own friends, which last was to determine everyone's fate according to his merits. So this Fronto slew all those that had been seditious and robbers, who were impeached one by another. But of the young men he chose out the tallest and most beautiful, and reserved them for the triumph. And as for the rest of the multitude that were above seventeen years old, he put them into bonds and sent them to the Egyptian mines. Titus also sent a great number into the provinces as a present to them, that they might be destroyed upon their theaters by the sword and by the wild beasts. But those that were under seventeen years of age were sold for slaves. Now. During the days wherein Fronto was distinguishing these men, there perished for want of food eleven thousand, some of whom did not taste any food, through the hatred their guards bore to them, and others would not take in any when it was given them. The multitude also was so very great that they were in want even of corn for their sustenance. Now, the number of those that were carried captive during this whole war was collected to be 97,000, as was the number of those that perished during the whole siege 1,100,000, the greater part of whom was indeed of the same nation with the citizens of Jerusalem, but not belonging to the city itself. They were come up from all the country to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and were on a sudden shut up by an army which, at the very first, occasioned so great a straitness among them that there came a pestilential destruction upon them, and soon afterward such a famine as destroyed them more suddenly. That this city could contain so many people in it is manifest by that number of them which was taken under Cestius, who, 
being desirous of informing Nero of the power of the city, who otherwise was disposed to contemn that nation, entreated the high priests, if the thing were possible, to take the number of their whole multitude. So these high priests, upon the coming of that feast which is called the Passover, when they slay their sacrifices, from the ninth hour till the eleventh, but so that a company not less than ten belong to every sacrifice, for it is not lawful for them to feast singly by themselves, and many of them were twenty in a company, found the number of sacrifices was two hundred and fifty-six thousand five hundred, which, upon the allowance of no more than ten that feast together, amounts to two millions seven hundred thousand and two hundred persons that were pure and holy. For as to those that have the leprosy, or the gonorrhea, or women that have their monthly courses, or such as are otherwise polluted, it is not lawful for them to be partakers of this sacrifice, nor indeed for any foreigners neither who come hither to worship. Now this vast multitude is indeed collected out of remote places, but the entire nation was now shut up by fate as in prison, and the Roman army encompassed the city when it was crowded with inhabitants. Accordingly, the multitude of those that therein perished exceeded all the destructions that either men or God ever brought upon the world. For, to speak only of what was publicly known, the Romans slew some of them, some they carried captives, and others they made a search for underground. And when they found where they were, they broke up the ground and slew all they met with. There were also found slain there above two thousand persons, partly by their own hands and partly by one another, but chiefly destroyed by the famine. But then the ill savor of the dead bodies was most offensive to those that lighted upon them, insomuch that some were obliged to get away immediately, while others were so greedy of gain that they would go in among the dead bodies that lay on heaps and tread upon them, for a great deal of treasure was found in these caverns, and the hope of gain made every way of getting it to be esteemed lawful. Many also of those that had been put in prison by the tyrants were now brought out, for they did not leave off their barbarous cruelty at the very last. Yet did God avenge himself upon them both in a manner agreeable to justice. As for John, he wanted food together with his brethren in these caverns, and begged that the Romans would now give him their right hand for his security, which he had often proudly rejected before. But for Simon, he struggled hard with the distress he was in, till he was forced to surrender himself. So he was reserved for the triumph, and to be then slain, as was John condemned to perpetual imprisonment. And now the Romans set fire to the extreme parts of the city, and burned them down, and entirely demolished its walls. And thus was Jerusalem taken, in the second year of the reign of Vespasian, on the eighth day of the month Gorpeus, Elul. It had been taken five times before, though this was the second time of its desolation, for Shishak, the king of Egypt, and after him Antiochus, and after him Pompey, and after them Sosius and Herod took the city, but still preserved it. But before all these, the king of Babylon conquered it and made it desolate, one thousand four hundred and sixty-eight years and six months after it was built. But he who first built it was a potent man among the Canaanites, and is in our own tongue called Melchizedek, the righteous king, for such he really was, on which account he was there the first priest of God, and first built a temple there, and called the city Jerusalem, which was formerly called Salem. However, David, the king of the Jews, ejected the Canaanites, and settled his own people therein. It was demolished entirely by the Babylonians, four hundred and seventy-seven years and six months after him, and from King David, who was the first of the Jews who reigned therein, to this destruction under Titus, 
were 1,179 years. But from its first building till this last destruction were 2,177 years. Yet hath not its great antiquity, nor its vast riches, nor the diffusion of its nation over all the habitable earth, nor the greatness of the veneration paid to it on a religious account, been sufficient to preserve it from being destroyed. And thus ended the siege of Jerusalem. <laughs>